Jesus' name. You can make your way back to your seats, but please remain standing for the reading of the word. Jeremiah 5.25, if you have your Bibles. Just one verse of scripture to begin, but as I just mentioned, I do feel like I have a strong word for this for this group of individuals here tonight. And uh, I, I kind of plan on going a different direction. I uh, kind of had a couple different thoughts going in my brain. It's April Fool's Day, and uh, tonight, Pastor, my dad is actually talking about the fool in Proverbs that crossed my mind. Uh, I was thinking about talking about something different that we've been discussing in our P7 clubs. Who's going to bring that to the youth group tonight? But just felt strongly prompted in this other direction. And so if you would just give not, me not just your attention, I appreciate that, but, but if you would just open up your heart and just be ready to receive something from God, direction from His Word, I, I just really believe that He wants to bring that tonight. And so just be ready to receive it. Jeremiah 5.25 says this, Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. Now, when I was kind of prepping for this, and even before I was prepping for it, there was a, a sermon title that caught my attention. And uh, I am a YouTube troller, and I go on YouTube looking for thieves, and I find a lot of them. Now, it's a great moral debate, and I won't get into it tonight. We talked about it yesterday at our P7 Club, whether it's morally wrong to steal sermons to propagate the gospel. We can, we can get into that another time. <laughs> but I troll the internet, and I, I watch for people, and I try to penalize them when I can. Anyway, <laughs> but I was trolling YouTube the other day looking for pirates, because that's what I think they are. <laughs> I need to move on from that. I'm bitter. I'm just teasing. But as I was looking through YouTube and just uh, I deal with our, our church content on our YouTube page, a sermon title by a guy named Mark Brown. He, he spoke at General Conference. He's the one that smushed his face against the podium at General Conference. Remember that? You guys watch General Conference? It's his Twitter picture. Look up M. Brown's pocket on Twitter. His, his uh, Twitter picture is like a, his face smushed against glass. And if you didn't know what that was from, you'd wonder, what in the world is this guy on? But uh, anyway, Mark Brown, he... He preached a sermon, and I'm going to borrow his title. I'm not borrowing his sermon. It's, he's preached about something completely different. But the title grabbed me. And I just want to preach to you on a few minutes here tonight on this subject. While you were sinning. While you were sinning. One more time, let's just lift up our voices and pray. And again, just if you could just, in whatever way you know how to do it, just make your heart ready to receive from the Lord because I do feel like he wants to speak to us tonight. Let's lift up our hands and lift up our voices in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for your presence. Thank you, God, for, for the fact that you don't leave us the way that you find us, but that you continue to prod us by your word and, and through your spirit to grow and become better and become stronger. Lord Jesus, we thank you for that. We're thankful that you care enough about us to not leave us in the state that we're currently in, but you want us to be better for your kingdom so that we can be used mightily by you. In the name of Jesus, I'm praying that somebody would hear what you're saying tonight. God, let me hear in a deeper way and in a fresh way what thus saith the Lord. God, I don't want it to be missed even by my ears, God, tonight. So I'm praying that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would not just rest on my mouth to speak it, but God, let it rest on my ears to hear it and also on the ears of everybody else here tonight to hear your word and be doers of your word. We ask it in the name of Jesus. And can we just offer up a great hand clap and shout of praise unto God. We worship you, God. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus. And you can be seated tonight. I think you know this, but there's not really that many people in our modern day Christian world that preach against sin anymore. It's not really a popular subject amongst sinners. <laughs> you know, when you tell a sinner that they're in sin, they don't like that. But it's, it's necessary for people to know 
what sin is. So anyway, not many preachers preach against sin anymore. It's not popular. It makes people feel uncomfortable. And just at the bottom, the bottom line is that it challenges their lifestyle. But nonetheless, we need to be reminded from time to time the nasty negative effects of sin. 21st century Christian culture doesn't really even like to call sin, sin anymore. We tend to downplay sin. I'm not talking about this church or, or this um, particular uh, fellowship, organization. Sometimes I think we do. But I'm talking the Christian world in general, and I use that term loosely for some churches. But we tend to downplay sin. We, you know, all kinds of churches, they're accepting all different types of sin that even a few decades ago, even one decade ago, they said was wrong. We tend to sugarcoat and candy coat what sin really is. Instead of adultery, we say an affair or they're running around. Well, has anybody ever run around before? I've run around. I've never committed adultery. Uh, you know, us gathering here tonight, that's an affair. You know, we're having an affair right now. You know, we're, we're having an event. It's an affair. You understand? That's what the word means. But, but we've dumbed down sin. We just say, oh, it's an affair. It's running around. Instead of fornication, we say hooking up or sleeping together. And we, we've come to understand those terms as synonymous, but really, you know, I hook up with buddies sometimes, and I'm not doing that kind of stuff with my buddies. Okay, let's just be real. I, I sleep, um, but sleeping does not necessarily constitute fornication, but we've dumbed it down. You follow me? Instead of a pervert, we say alternate lifestyle. It's just crazy. We tend to play nice with sin. We tend to candy coat sin. But we need not to because sin doesn't play nice with us. In case you've never heard it before, here's what sin will do. You've probably heard it, but it says this. Sin will take you further than you wanted to go. It'll keep you longer than you wanted to stay. And it will make you pay more than you ever wanted to pay. That's what sin will do. Sin is treacherous. Sin doesn't play nice. Now scripturally, the primary repercussion of sin is death. Somebody say death. First and foremost, that is the, the, the repercussion of sin. Sometimes it's literally in the example of perhaps a drug overdose. Doing drugs, that's not right. Being outside your right mind, that's not scriptural. That's not uh, kosher scripturally. And sometimes that leads to literal death. Drunk, drunk driving accidents, that's a a literal death caused by sin. Lethal STDs and STIs like HIV and AIDS, that's sin that leads to physical death, but, but it's not typically and not traditionally literal death. But the type of death we're talking about is spiritual death. Sin always leads to spiritual death. Genesis 2 and 3, in this passage, in this chapter of the Bible, God is telling Adam and Eve what will happen if they disobey him and they sin. You know, they eat the fruit of the tree. Verse... Um, 17. Is it verse 3 or verse 17? I have 17 here. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Somebody say die. So if you disobey me, God said, if you sin, the byproduct of your sin will be death. Now we know from the Bible that Adam and Eve didn't drop dead when they sinned. And so the question is, did God lie? Was God just, you know, trying to convince them not to sin, and he, he threatened them with something very severe, and then when they did it, it, he didn't follow through. Did God lie to them? No. They didn't physically die, but they did die spiritually. Before their sin, they were meant to live forever in the Garden of Eden. But because of that sin, death entered into the human race. And some 900-odd years later, Adam would die, and Eve would die sometime in that span. Death entered into the human race because the byproduct of sin is death. Here's some other scriptures that illustrate this. Ezekiel 14, 18 and 4, the second half of that verse, it says, the soul that sinneth, that sins and continues to sin, it shall die. Romans 6, 23, for the wages or the paycheck of sin, what you've earned if you sin is death. When you say death, that's a repercussion of sin. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, the apostle, he said, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust, and he's enticed by that lust. And then if he'll allow that lust to conceive in his heart and in his mind, it will bring forth sin, and then sin, the byproduct of it, when it is finished, it will bring forth 
death. Somebody say death. You see, sin always results in death. There's no escaping it. When you sin, something dies. You might not drop dead physically, but something in your life dies, and ultimately your soul and your spirit will die if you don't deal with that sin. Let me tell you how how sin brings about death in our everyday life. If you sin sexually, I've said it before from this podium, but I'll say it again. If you sin sexually, intimacy dies. Intimacy with the future spouse dies, even if the one you're committing sexual sin with ends up being your spouse. It damages intimacy. It kills it because sin brings death. If you lie and you're deceitful, people's trust in you dies because sin brings death. If you're disobedient and rebellious to authority, whether it be your parents or, or your pastors or your teachers or, or cops or whatever, any, any form of authority in your life, if you rebel against that authority, your own ability to exercise authority dies because only when you're under authority can you exercise authority. So you see, even in our everyday lives, if we sin in an area, something in that area will die because sin always brings death. We're not just talking about heaven or hell here. That's that's part of it, and that's eternity. But even in this life, day-to-day sins, they can kill things in our day-to-day life. The scripture says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, he shall also reap. If If you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption byproduct of sinning is death. And that scripture tells us that when you sow it, you will reap it. There's no escaping it. Sin is treacherous. And sin leads to death. You know, when I see, when I see saints, let me just be candid here for a minute. Can I be candid? I usually never even ask you permission, so I'm, I'm being nice tonight. Can I be candid? <laughs> but when I see saints, and, and you guys are great saints for the most part. I love you guys. When I see saints, whether they be young or whether they be old, when I see them and they are spiritually dead, they don't worship God, they don't get behind the preacher, they don't seem to have a love for the Word of God or the presence of God or the house of God or anything to do with God. They kind of come, they sit on the pew like a bump on a log kind of thing. When I see people, when I see saints rather that are dead, I could likely trace it back to some sin in their life. Because again, the byproduct of deadness and death, it's sin. So if you go back into the background of some deadness in someone's life, probably you're going to find some sin. An attitude perhaps, unforgiveness, bitterness, slander, sexual immorality, lying, cheating, stealing, whatever it might be. If you look in the background of deadness, you're going to find sin somewhere. And I'm not just making this up. Jesus even tells us this. Matthew 24, 12. He said, because iniquity shall abound. You know what iniquity is? Iniquity is simply unrepentant sin. It's a, it's a violation of God's law that you do not rectify or deal with. It's when you step across the line of God's boundaries and you say, nana, nana, boo, boo, not going back. That's iniquity. It's unrepentant sin. And Jesus said, because unrepentant sin abounds, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You know, the reason that some people are so cold spiritually It's not because they have bad days all the time. It's because there's iniquity in their life. That's what Jesus said. And maybe that's you tonight. Maybe the reason you find yourself coming to church and you just can't lift your hands and you can't sense the presence of God and you can't feel anything and and nothing's moving, nothing's shaking in your spirit. You're dead. You know, maybe tonight it's because in the background there's sin and you know it. Your apathy, your complacency, it tells on you because Jesus tells us the reason for apathy and coldness, and it's iniquity. It's iniquity. Unrepentant sin. Very few things lead to apathetic living for God, like sin issues in the background. You see, your coldness, and I'm saying your in a general sense, but but please don't let it miss the personal tonight. Your coldness is is the byproduct primarily of a deeper sin issue. It might not be an overt sin of commission, but perhaps a sin of omission, not doing things that you know that are good. James said to them, those things are sin. So not just when you know to spend time with God in God's word or or whatever, you fill in the blank. If you know to do something good, you don't do it. You can be in sin. And so coldness, Apathetic living, complacency, it's a byproduct of a deeper sin 
issue. Sin always leads to death. Sin always leads to deadness. It does. And so that's one byproduct of sin. Death. Somebody say death. If you experience that in your life, you need to just stop, you know, trying to pull the wool over your own, your own eyes and deceive yourself and just realize, you know what, I, I got to deal with some of the sin in my life. The reason I can't feel the presence of God, it's not because the sermons aren't good and, and the singers aren't singing good. And the reason I can't enter into the presence of God, it's not because maybe somebody hit a wrong note or, or maybe the, the, you know, the, the musicians weren't quite right in Maine or wherever. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with sin. It has to do with sin. Can't say it any other way. Another byproduct of sin is separation. Eternally, but also in this life. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul, he wrote, and he was speaking of those who don't obey the gospel, and he said this, they shall be punish, punished with everlasting destruction from or away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And so people that don't obey the gospel and they live in sin, the scripture tells us that they will be from the presence of God. They will be separated from God because sin brings separation. But there's another verse that, that even more powerfully illustrates this, not in an eternal sense, but even in an in a everyday sense. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. The prophet wrote and said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that he, it cannot hear. But, but your iniquities, let me say iniquity, they have separated between you and your God and your sins. They have hid his face from you that he will not hear. You see, sin is such a separator to the extent that the omniscient, all-knowing God that can hear everything and see everything, it causes him to turn a deaf ear to you and your prayers when you are living in that unrepentant sin. That's how, how strong the separation is. It's like a wedge that gets in your life and it drives you further from God. You know, that's a sobering verse, isn't it? Sobering to me. I remember when just a while ago I, I came across that verse, somebody was preaching about it, talking about it, and it just hit me like, wow, sin is that treacherous that the all-knowing, all-hearing God doesn't hear me? That's what sin will do. And so some of us, you know, you may wonder why you struggle to have a prayer life. The question is, how's your walk? How are you living? Are you living right? Do you got that iniquity in your life somewhere? Maybe it's in the background somewhere. Maybe it's some attitude, some, some spirit that's gotten a hold of you. Maybe it's an action. Maybe it's something immoral. How's your walk? Because if you got sin in there, you know, God will hear the cry of a repentant heart. He'll always hear that. But if your prayers aren't getting beyond the ceiling, it's like, God bless me. God help me in this situation. God, God bring my family together. God do this. God do that. God help me to be a witness here. Help me to do something for this person. Your prayers don't seem to be doing anything. How's your walk? How are you doing with sin? Are you constantly dabbling in it? Are you constantly playing with it? Are you playing games with your soul? Sobering verse. We need to stop playing nice with sin. Somebody say amen. We need to stop playing nice with sin. Just because God has given provision to cover our sins, it doesn't mean that we should keep running back to them. I think it was John who wrote, he said, I write unto you, little children, that you sin not. So the goal, obviously, is to not sin. But if you sin, right? Then he goes, he says, if you sin. So he makes uh, provision for our humanity and for our failures. And then he also makes provision for rectification and rec reconciliation. He says, if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Same word as comforter there. We have a comforter with the Father. If you sin, if you fall into sin, you're not supposed to, but if you do, God's there. He'll, he will help you. And, and so I think sometimes when we read verses like this, we can start thinking, well, you know, God's given me provision uh, for covering my sin. Is there really any benefit then to to living an overcoming life? Like if I, if I sin, I know that God's mercy is new every morning and I can be forgiven and I can be ready for heaven again. You know, really, is there any benefit to being an overcomer and actually ridding your life of sin? There's a whole lot of people, there's a whole lot of Christians that keep on running back to the same old sin time and time and time again. And they never overcome it. They never get beyond it. And, and they keep on, you know, they'll pray the prayer for, of repentance and ask God for, the, for his forgiveness. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
But what are we missing out on while we're sinning? What great dimension of God using us are we missing out on while we're going through this constant cycle of sinning, repentance, sinning, repentance, sinning, repentance? And I'm not saying that, that we're not going to ever fall. A just man falls seven times, right? There's, you know, that's a just man. We're not even talking about a sinner. A just person, a saint of God will fall seven times. Micah, he wrote, he said, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, for when I fall, not even if I fall, he said, I am going to fall. I am going to fall. And you will fall. But, but do we have to stay at that low level of just, you know, falling, getting up, and just staying here, and then falling and staying up? Is there anything beyond that? What are we missing out on by just staying there and not becoming an overcomer? You see, I, I really believe that it's God's will that we not just struggle with sin the rest of our lives as we are in the church. You know, we get saved, we repent, we're baptized, we're filled with the Holy Ghost. I, I don't think it's God's will for us to just stay there and deal with the same old junk that we always dealt with. Deal with the same old habits day in and day out. I don't think that that's God's will. I think that God has a work of sanctification for us in our lives. We need to grow in God. We need to get beyond some things and leave the beggarly elements of the world even after we're saved. Because I think we miss a whole lot of God's purpose and God's plan while we are sinning. Beyond just salvation. Beyond just salvation. We can be saved. I don't know. Maybe this is not theologically sound. You, you can ask pastor. You know, I think that, maybe I don't even want to go there, but I, I think that you can have some issues and have some struggles and fall from time to time and, and ask God to forgive you and, and, and you'll still go to heaven if you're right with God in the, in the moment that he comes back. I think that that's possible. But I think you're going to stay at a low level of being used of God and doing something for his kingdom while on this earth. I think you're going to have to give account for that. I think you have to give account for that. We need to stop playing nice with sin. We need to have a, a spirit that strives to not just be forgiven of sin, but to overcome sin. That's kind of what I'm saying. When we continuously sin, sin, repent, sin, repent. Some have said it this way. It is the mock of God's patience and the rape of his mercy. The mock of God's patience and the rape of of his mercy. Hebrews 10, 29, the writer said, of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. He's talking about sanctified people, saved people, people that have experienced a new birth. They've counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. For we know that uh, we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. He's going to judge the world, but he's going to judge his people too. Verse 31. This is a verse we don't say nearly enough. It is a fearful thing. It is a frightening thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is a warning in this passage to people who are saved. People who should know better, but still continuously turn to their sin into their hang-ups. There is greater punishment for those that fall away from the truth into sinful living. Greater than, than the worst sinner that never has known God. There's greater punishment for somebody maybe like you that basically turns the grace of God into lasciviousness, loose living, and, and you trample underfoot the blood of the covenant. You know, we don't talk about the fear of God very much anymore, do we? We don't. I don't think we talk about it near enough. And if we do talk about it, we downplay it to simply mean awe or reverence, which it is. It is that having a fear of God means reverencing him and, and being in awe of him. But at the core of it, fear simply means fear. There's nothing wrong with having a good amount of godly fear in your life of what might happen to you if you don't smarten up. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, when I was a kid, you know what kept me from trouble as a kid? It wasn't that I knew my dad was a merciful dad, and he was. But I kept out of trouble, be trouble because I was afraid of, of what dad would do if he found out what I did. I was afraid of my dad. I love my dad. I've always loved my dad. I think he's one of the greatest men in the world. I love him. But I was afraid of my dad, and I'm still afraid of my dad. <laughs> 
I work for my dad now. I work for the Lord, but I work at this church. He's a pastor. He's my boss. Pastor Jack's also my boss. And there's a godly fear in my heart that if I act a fool, do something stupid, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get a talking to. I'm not going to get a, you know, maybe a beating. That would be awkward. But it was that level of fear as a kid, and even now in my life, that, that makes me think twice before acting like an idiot. It was fear. It still is fear. We love to talk about God as a loving father, and we ought to because he is that. God is love. That's what the scripture says. But, but we need to remember that God is also a righteous judge, and he is worthy of some fear. He's worthy of us being a little bit intimidated by him. We can love him because he loves us, and, and, and I'm not trying to, to take away from any of that, but I think we can overdose on the love sometimes, and we need to go back, and we need to remember that God still is a righteous judge. And there is coming a day when he will judge all the people of the world. And everyone will give account of their actions. And they'll give account of every idle word that they have ever spoke. And that ought to strike a little bit of godly fear into our hearts, if I do say so. Realizing that we will have to answer to a righteous judge someday should make us think twice about committing that sin that we go to oh so often. Psalm 111.10, it says, The fear of the Lord. Not the love for the Lord, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of wisdom. The reason that some of you keep making the same unwise, stupid decisions is because you don't have a proper fear of God's coming judgment and wrath. You don't have a proper fear of eternal damnation and separation from God in a lake of fire in a place called hell. That doesn't register with us anymore, does it? We've seen so many action flicks and we've seen so many apocalyptic movies, things like hell. When we read about scripture, the simple things of the word of God, it doesn't grip us anymore. I I don't even think that I've fully experienced it the way that the elders did when preachers would preach about about brimstone and fire and gnashing of teeth and, and wailing. It doesn't grip us anymore, but it ought to. There ought to be a, a level of godly fear that comes into, into a service just like this and some conviction that rests on us about the things that we keep going to and running back to. It's the fear of the Lord that brings wisdom, not love. Love is great. You know, love is the greatest of these things. What is it? Faith, hope, and love. Love is the greatest. I'm not taking away from love tonight, but I am saying we need to, to have a fear of the Lord. You know, I, I think sometimes we as the church, because so many of the other, you know, charismatic, crazy people, uh, they preach so much on God's grace, and I think we sometimes feel the need to do that as well, and, and we'll preach about God's grace, and we ought to. I love God's grace, but at some point, we just need to start living right. I love the fact that God's mercies are new every morning. I've had to utilize that many more times than I'd even like to admit. But at some point, we just got to start living right. You know, I think that grace preaching and mercy preaching, you know, mercy is for the saints. I believe that grace is for the sinner. That's what I personally believe. But I I think that, that grace preaching and love preaching is powerful. And we need to talk about it even amongst the church. But I think grace should be preached primarily to the sinner. And at some point, we just need to start preaching to the church. Let's pull up our socks. Let's pick up our bootstraps and start living right. I was watching a preacher, Kenneth Carpenter. He's the the, uh, ALJC superintendent. Great organization, another apostolic organization. And he got talking how we, we overdose on this grace message. And maybe you disagree with me. Maybe that rubs against you a little bit the wrong way. But I think he's right. At some point... The church, if you're a part of the church, you just got to start living right. You just got to start saying, you know what? This thing over here is sin. I should not do that. I I need to start walking more with God. It's really not a complicated equation, but but we just overdose on grace. Overdose on grace. God will forgive me. God will forgive me. And he will. I'm never taking away from that. I would never take away from that. But can we get beyond the sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent thing? I think we need to. I know God will forgive me no matter how many times I fall into sin. But we need to ask ourselves, I think, a deeper question. We need to ask ourselves, what do we forfeit while we sin? Beyond potentially going to hell, what do we forfeit when we sin? I believe that our sin brings us much more than just the chance of hell. I think it it brings so much more than that. 
I think it even brings more than damage to our own personal life, lives. I think sin brings much more than that. See, I believe that there is a purpose behind not sinning, beyond just our eternal destination. That's major. But I think that there's more than that. I think there's way more at stake than just us, our eternity, our lives, our well-being. There's more. I think that our sin forfeits so much beyond that. It holds us back from victory. It holds us back from spiritual advancement and growing the kingdom of God. It does. You know, I think that one of the greatest lies that the enemy could ever get a child of God to believe is that your sin only affects you. Despite the warnings of Scripture, there there are some people, even those in the church, even some under the sound of my voice, tonight, and I'm not ignorant to how some of you live. You think you've got the wool pulled over my eyes, but I'm not ignorant. I'm not ignorant. I'm not coming down on anybody, but, but I'm just being real here tonight. But despite the warnings of Scripture, some people, even in the church, they still decide to engage in sin. Some have made up their minds that, you know, they're tough enough. They're tough guys, tough girls, and they can handle the consequences of it. And, and the risk of losing their soul for all eternity, it's worth the gain of momentary pleasure to them. Now, these people, I think for the most part, they believe that they're the only ones that will suffer because of their sin. But Scripture seems to point to a different reality. And tonight, before we go home, and as I conclude this message, I've come to preach tonight that not only does your sin affect you, your soul, and your eternity, but your sin and your dabbling in it, it affects others. Others in the church and others that are not yet in the church. And the enemy seeks to keep people believing that their sin will only affect them, but that is a lie from the deepest pit of hell. Yes, sin affects the person who commits it, but it impacts others around them too. When you realize this, that that your sin affects your ability to impact the lives of others and be a witness and so on, it brings new purpose to you living right and defeating temptation. It reminds me every time that I face it that I need to be on my game spiritually, not just for my life and not just for my eternity, but for the eternity of somebody else. That's what the scripture teaches me. Have you ever thought about all the potential souls that you have perhaps forfeited to the mouth of a yawning hell when you say yes to that temptation? Has it ever crossed your mind? It's crossed mine and it's gripped me. Has it ever occurred to you And I pray the next time that you or I are tempted that the faces of all those unsaved friends that we go to school with or work with, they flash into our minds. You see, it matters how we live. Not just for us, but for others. Don't try to tell me that your sin only affects you. Don't believe that puke. Here's some proof text for you. Exodus 20 and 5. God said to Moses, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them idols, nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers, not just upon the fathers, but upon the children, under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And the flip side, verse 6, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now we love to focus on verse 6 there, the second half of the promise, that that God will, will be with those to a thousand generations. And we ought to focus on that. That's powerful. But we can't forget the first part. The first part tells us, verse 5 tells us, that, tells us that the sins of the father don't only affect the father, but they affect his family to three and four generations. Don't try to tell me that your sin only affects you. Don't try to get me to believe that my sin only affects me. That's a lie. Not only is this principle true in a general sense, but it's also true specifically in the body of Christ. When writing about this subject, and I'm trying to come to a close here, but I just feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. When writing about this subject, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, and whether one member su- suffers. Somebody say one. If just one suffers, then all the members suffer with it. Or if one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Go back to verse 26, if you will. This verse is saying that in the church, if just one person is dealing with something, we all deal with it to a degree because we're a body, we're a family. And we often quote this verse about adversity, emotional pain, setbacks, financially, whatever. And when one person is going through a difficulty, the body of Christ senses that and empathizes with that, and that is true. However, I think that there's a deeper meaning here. 
I feel that this verse, it illustrates the interconnected nature of the church. You see, what happens in your life, whether for good or bad, has a direct impact on the entire body of Christ. That works in the negative and it works in the positive. If you're a praying and a fasting young person, if you're a praying and a fasting individual, you better believe that's going to bless your life. But it blesses beyond just your life. It also blesses the body. And I'm so thankful that for, for young men and young women that know what it is to get before God and seek his face and pray and fast and, and read the word of God every day. I'm thankful for you. You know why? Because it allows us to feel what we felt at the beginning of service tonight. Just one person getting before God and praying. It can make a difference. It impacts the body. But you know what? It also works in the negative. If you're in the church and you're sinning, gossiping, and allowing lustful and carnal spirits into your life or whatever else, you better believe that's going to hinder you. You can't sow to the flesh and not reap corruption. So it will affect you, but it also hinders the body. Don't try to tell me that your sin only affects you. The Apostle Paul deeply understood how, how much someone else's sin could affect others, so he said this, 1 Corinthians 5.11, I've written unto you not to keep company. Don't hang out with people. If any man that is called a brother... Not talking about someone that's a sinner, but if somebody calls himself a brother, they're in the church, they sit beside you in the, in the pew. If they call themselves a brother, yet they're a fornicator, covetous, covetous, an idolater, a slanderer, a railer, a drunkard, an extortioner, that's a swindler, a cheat. Paul said, with such, don't even go to eat with them. Don't even go to Boston Pizza after church with people like that. If they're in the church, but they're living in sin, don't hang out with them. Don't have a meal with them. Avoid them. You need to distance yourself from people that call themselves Christians, but they openly live these ways. If you're not careful, their rebellious, lustful, hateful spirit will rub off on you. You can come back to music, give people hope. What I'm trying to do tonight is show you how your sin can and does affect others. Paul understood it so deeply that he said, don't even hang around them because it will affect you. Sinful attitudes and spirits move through the body like a virus, which is why we're not even to eat with people openly in sin. Paul even said to identify people, mark people that cause division and are rebellious in their spirit. Doesn't sound very loving, does it? Doesn't sound very loving to mark people, to identify people that are they're acting stupid. That's what Paul said to do. Your sin affects others. Don't try to convince me otherwise. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, we all understand that that sin didn't just affect him. Paul said in Romans 5, 12, wherefore, as by one man, just one man, sin entered the whole world and death by sin. And so death had passed upon all men for that all have sinned. You see, because of one sin by one man, death entered into everybody's life. Everybody was made a sinner because of one. Don't try to tell me that your sin only affects you. I've come to bring a sobering reminder tonight of what your sin really costs, not just you, but others. Did you know that there are people in your life that are counting on you to live for God? Your lost family is counting on you to live for God and hang up the hang up and overcome the sin. The friends you hang out with that are, that are just so instant, they don't even know any better right now. They are counting on you to live for God. Your neighbors are counting on you to get things right in your life. You know, if you struggle to live for God, for your own benefit, for heaven's sake, live for God for all the lost souls that you're connected to. They are counting on you to be on your spiritual game. They're counting on you to speak a word from God into their life. They're counting on you to shine his light into their darkness. And when we continue to live on the low level of sin and repent, sin and repent, over and over and over. Who knows how many opportunities for the kingdom we're missing? Who knows how many opportunities to speak a word of encouragement or to share the gospel or to sense in the Holy Ghost when somebody is just prime for, for a, a word? Who knows how many times we miss that because we're living here and we never get beyond it and overcome. You know, I've thought before, and if you haven't, I hope you think it from here on out. How many souls were forfeited because I was not where I needed to be spiritually? What spiritual victories were forfeited, not just in my life, but in the lives of my brothers and sisters while I 
was sinning. You see, we don't really grasp what we miss and what we forfeit while we are sinning. I think we understand we might go to hell. And the fact that we toy with that, it, it frightens me. But I don't think we understand the bigger consequences, the things we forfeit for others. To me, one of the most sobering and challenging passages in Scripture is found in the book of Joshua. And this is where I will end. Please turn to Joshua 6 and 7 if you have your Bibles or technology. Just before the city of Jericho was destroyed by God, Joshua gave a warning to his people not to take any plunder from Jericho. He said it was cursed, so don't take it. Joshua 6, 18, And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the cursed thing, lest you make yourselves cursed when you take of the cursed thing. So first and foremost, if you take it, you're going to be cursed, but then watch. And also make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Joshua saying, was saying, if you sin, if you disobey God, you'll pay, but we all will pay. Many times we understand what our sin does to us, but we fail to remember what our sin does to others. After the walls fell, Joshua 7 says this, verse 1, But the children of Israel, they committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Please notice, only one man sinned. But the word says that the children of Israel committed a trespass. Only one man sinned, but the Bible says that God was angry, not just with one man, but an entire nation. Don't try to tell me that your sin only affects you. After this, Israel tried to go from Jericho and defeat the people of Ai. I promise I'm almost done. Please be patient with me. Ai was weak. They were a frail army compared to Israel. They thought, oh, we can take them easily. They just sent a few guys up to take them. And yet, Ai still defeated the Israelites. Now Joshua was naturally perplexed about this. He was distraught and he mourned over it. But God, he came to Joshua and he said this, verse 11, Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them for they have even taken of the cursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also and they have put it even among their own stuff. Please again notice, only one man sin, sinned but God said, Israel has sinned. We learn from this passage a very sobering principle. And it's this, that the actions of just one person can hold back victory for many more beyond that person. Now, I am not trying tonight to condemn anybody, make anybody feel bad or point any fingers at people living in sin. You know who you are. I, I could probably guess some of you, but definitely God knows. I'm not trying to condemn you, but I am trying to help you see that there is something at stake, whether you sin or not, beyond your soul. Whenever you face temptation, remember, it's not just your eternity on the line, but perhaps the eternity and the soul of someone you would otherwise share the gospel with or otherwise be a witness to. Can I just suggest that perhaps the next greatest revival that needs to break out in this youth group and community, it depends on whether not the youth group gets it together, but whether or not you get it together. Whether or not you, singular, individually get that sin out of the camp or not out of your life. I've come to encourage somebody and challenge somebody. Next time you're facing temptation to go do something stupid and idiotic, can we start calling it what it is? It's stupid and absolutely idiotic to sin. But the next time you're tempted to do something like that, remember, please remember that your sin doesn't only affect you. There is something bigger riding on you overcoming that struggle. How you live is important. Your conduct matters because you are part of something bigger than yourself. You're part of, first of all, a body of Christ. And you're a part of a world that desperately needs to know Christ. The enemy would say that you are insignificant and your sin doesn't matter. But I have come to encourage you and tell you, you are not insignificant. You play a part in revival. You becoming an overcomer play a part in revival. Maybe you won't be the one singing in a mic or, or preaching that great sermon from behind a podium, but perhaps you living a holy life can bring about great victory. Don't touch what God has declared 
as cursed because it's not only you that pays the price. We all pay a price. Don't let the enemy lie to you and say that as long as you keep your sin a secret, it won't hurt anybody else. That is a lie. It's a lie. Achan kept his sin hidden under the rug of his tent. Nobody knew. Not his family. Not those closest to him. And yet the entire nation still missed a great victory. Can I just tell you, your ability to keep it hidden doesn't keep it affecting. Keep it from affecting your brothers and sisters in Christ. Your parents might not know. Your pastors might not know. Your closest friends might not know. Your spouse or your significant other might not know, but God knows, and you know, and it's time to get sin out of the camp. Yeah, my soul depends on it. You better bet your soul on it. But I've also come to say corporate victory depends on it. Revival depends on it. My friends at school, their souls depend on it. My youth group depends on it. My family, those that are lost in my family, depends on it. This community depends on it. It depends on me. Somebody say me. Somebody just put your hand on your chest for a moment and just realize the personal nature of this message. We can miss it in the corporate sense if we're not careful, but God is after you. God is after your sin. God is after you to put away the cursed thing, to clean it out of your tent, to hang up the hang up and strive to be an overcomer. It's not okay to just keep sinning and repenting over and over and over and over again. God has more than that for you. Again, if you struggle to live for God for yourself, for heaven's sake, for this world's sake, for your church's sake, live for God for your youth group. Live for God for those you go to church with. Live for God for the lost. They're counting on you. Even now, the enemy would say, no, they're not. Yeah, they are. The devil is a liar. I'm going to conclude tonight, not with a heavy sentiment, but I would like to conclude with Galatians 5.16. I don't even know if I gave this to the guys. Some of you have struggled with the same sin over and over again for years and years and years and years and years. Some of you are young. Maybe it's not been years, but for a long time. How many can just agree? You don't even have to raise your hand. Can anybody please agree? This is serious stuff. Remember the first time I heard about Aiken? I went to the altar and I bawled like a baby. I thought, good God, God, help me. This is not just about me. How do I overcome sin? If I have tried time and time again and I can't defeat it, how do I get past it? Number one, I think a fresh revelation of all that depends on it and is riding on it is what we need. And we're going to come around this altar. I know we're a little running over. If you're okay with that, I'm going to ask you to come around this front in a minute. A fresh revelation of what is riding on my sin and what is riding on me having that bad attitude or or having that rebellious spirit. What is riding on me continuing to go back to the same immoral activity or that same drink or that same drug. Fresh revelation of what's riding on it. But beyond that, I think so often we get so focused on the sin. We say, I gotta stop the sin. I gotta stop the sin. I gotta stop the sin. And we never do. I think it's because we focus a little bit too much on the sin. Paul said in Galatians 5, 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There is enough power in walking in the spirit towards the things of God to never ever again do the things and fulfill the lust of the flesh. There is enough power in that. The old song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And then once you're focused on him, walk in that direction, these things grow dim. The problem is we focus on these things. I'm a, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm addicted, I'm this, I'm that. And we get so consumed by that, we never overcome it. But if we'll just start walking in the spirit, if we'll start setting aside time every day to pray and seek God and read his word and get in the presence of God and fast, if we'll start doing that, every desire of this world will begin to fade because there's enough power in that that we shall not, not might not, shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Psalm 119.11, thy word have I hid in mine heart 
the writer said, that I might not sin against thee. Getting into the presence of God, listening for the word of God, not just the written Bible, but also his voice when we get in prayer. When we hide that in our heart, it makes it so that we won't sin against him. And so I'll say the best way to get beyond sin is a fresh revelation of what is riding on it, but also focusing on the right thing. And that is the only one that can help us get beyond it. That's Jesus Christ. Just bow your heads for a moment and just pray if, if you would. We need the Holy Ghost in this youth group. We need the Holy Ghost in our lives to begin pointing out the things that, that are wrong, that we need to change. It is not okay. God has more for us than just perpetually sinning and repenting. There is a level of overcoming that God wants to bring somebody to. And it's going to start tonight if you want it. And what you got to realize is that it's not just going to bless you. It's going to bless your youth group. Getting on fire for God is not just going to bless you, but it's going to do something in your school. And it's going to do something for your testimony and your witness. I wonder if we could just lift up our voice here and just pray. If you know how to pray in the Spirit, pray in the Spirit. If you don't even feel like talking in English right now, just pray in the Holy Ghost. Loose conviction. Loose the Spirit to draw men and women, young men and young women to the cross. In fact, you know what? If you would just stand with me and begin to make your way to this altar if you feel to. And just begin to lay something on this altar in the Spirit and say, God, I don't want to do it anymore. Something more important than just my soul rides on me getting past this. And God, I need your help. In the name of Jesus, I would just come and just continue to pray.